monthly debate series that features topics of special interest to libertarians and aims to enhance social and professional ties within New York City's libertarian community. This is an Oxford-style debate in which the audience initially votes for, against, or undecided on the resolution. Whoever moves the vote in his or her favor is declared the winner. Go into SohoVote.com to cast your initial vote. You'll find that tonight's resolution reads, Selfishness is a Virtue. We're partnered with Reason Magazine in presenting these debates, and you can catch audio of all our events on the Reason podcast, which you'll find in the iTunes store. Thanks to the Smith Family Foundation for making this series possible. For more information and to buy tickets to our future debates, go to our website at thesohoforum.org. I'm Gene Epstein, director of the Soho Forum. <coughs> Arguing for the affirmative on the resolution, selfishness is a virtue. We have Yaren Brook, director of the Iron Rand Institute. Yaren, please come to the stage. And since I will be arguing for the negative, I must recuse myself as moderator. Uh, for our guest moderator, we are honored to bring you Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, please come to the stage. I feel like this is some kind of a conspiracy in the basement of an old theater. Everybody's Italian, Catholic, Jewish, or atheist. <laughs> Very happy to be here. So, Yaron has the burden of proving the case that selfishness is a virtue, and we'll start his time now. Uh, and, uh, close the vote. Oh, and we, once Yaron starts, the voting is closed until we are told it is open again, which it will open at the end of the debate. Wow, there's lights. All right. Good evening, everybody. I can't see you. I think you're there. Uh, thank you, Gene, uh, for inviting me and for uh, choosing this particular topic for us to debate. I'm really looking forward to this. And thank you, Judge, for uh, moderating tonight's event. And thank you all uh, for being here tonight. Selfishness is a virtue. Now, that is a difficult proposition to make in the world in which we live. In a world in which selfishness is perceived to be a real vice, right? What do we associate with the word selfishness? We associate in popular culture with lying, stealing, cheating, backstabbing, being a real SOB, exploiting other people for one's own benefit. That is what the culture has come to identify with the term selfish, self-interest, egoist, all of those terms. When we point at somebody in the schoolyard and say, that kid's selfish, what we mean by that is he's a nasty, nasty person. He's going to do anything to anybody to get his way. But there's a problem. Because at the same time as that is true, it's also true, if you think a little objectively about the world selfish, which means taking care of self, and we see artists pursuing their passion and willing to give up everything to achieve their goal that they set for themselves, well, that's pretty selfish. We see business leaders trying to make money by trading, by producing, by making. Think Steve Jobs. What a selfish guy. How many people in the audience were asked by Steve Jobs what features you wanted in the iPhone? I can't see you, but I'm guessing the answer is zero. Steve Jobs built the iPhone the way he wanted it to be. He built the iPhone in his image to pursue a passion of his for the monetary benefit of himself. Steve Jobs was selfish. Every athlete out there, Michael Phelps, who worked tirelessly to become the greatest swimmer in history. For whom? For me? He cares that I enjoy watching swimming? No. For his parents? I hope not. He did it for himself. He was being 
selfish. So what's happened is that we have this term that has these mixed meanings inside of it. It has this idea of exploitation, of being mean, of being nasty, of being bad. And at the same time, it has all these positive things associated pursuing your values, pursuing your passion, trading, making, building. We call this a, a package deal. When you take one concept and you put two things inside of them, two things that ultimately are kind of contradictory. Because when you actually look at life, and when you have time to look at history and look at the people around you and look at who is successful and who fails, is lying, cheating, stealing, and being an SOB a successful strategy in life? Does it actually lead, other than in politics, does it actually lead to success and prosperity and happiness and, and living a full human life, flourishing as a human being? And the answer is no. If you actually look at the world around us, Bernie Madoff lands up in jail. But more than that, Bernie Madoff is miserable before he's caught. Not because he feels some innate guilt because he's lied and cheated and stealed, but because he has no self-esteem because he lied, stealed, and cheated, because he can't look his kids in the eye, because he can't have a conversation because something might slip out and they will discover that he lied, stole, and cheated. Of course, it was the kids who told the feds about him. You know, God forbid the SEC actually catches anybody who commits fraud. They're too busy monitoring Don and my three, 13 Ds and 13 Gs, right? Uh, so, no, it doesn't pay off. It's not in your self-interest to be the SOB in the schoolyard. Those people don't turn out well. They live horrible, miserable, pathetic lives. And this is, by the way, true of politicians. I've never met a, a happy politician. All you have to do is look at Bill Clinton or Hillary Clinton and see how miserable they are. They, they carry it on their faces. <laughs> and, and, I think this is, and I think this is true of most politicians. I've met a lot of politicians. I've never met a happy politician. They all look miserable because they've achieved what they've achieved, primarily through lying, cheating, some of them through stealing. But right? hey, have you ever wondered how these guys go into office poor and come out rich? I mean, it's just weird. $250,000 speaking fees at Goldman Sachs. So we've got a muddled concept. What does selfishness actually mean? If you look it up in a dictionary, it says, taking care of self, comma, any modern dictionary has the comma, at the expense of others. Now what the hell at the expense of others? Where did that come from? The only people with an incentive to add that at the expense of others are the people who want you not to be selfish, who want you to sacrifice, who want you to think always in terms of the public good and the public interest and the common. And who are those? Well, the people who want to control you. The people who want to tell you how to live and what to do because they know what's good for the public. They don't want you to live for yourself because they know that people who live for themselves want to be free, want to be free of authority, free of coercion, free of force. So the only people who want you to live for the public interest, for the common good, are the people who are going to channel the public good and the common interest to you and tell you how to live and destroy your ability to be free. But more than that, we've been taught for 2,000 years that what is good is to sacrifice. What is good is to live for others. What is good is not your happiness, but other people's happiness. And, and altruism is an ism. It means otherism. And Augustine Comte, who came up with the term altruism, didn't mean being nice to people and opening doors. Even egoists open doors for people. I know that's a shock for you. No, Augustine Comte meant that altruism means living for the sake of others, living for the sake of their happiness, living for the sake of their well-being. And the standard of your morality is how much you've sacrificed for the sake of other people. In other words, how much you have suffered for the sake of other people. Bill Gates makes $70 billion by changing the world and making people better off. I'm not going to explain the trade, trade of principle to this audience. I think you understand it. That the only way to become super rich is to benefit other people through trade. But he gets zero moral credit for that. Negative moral credit because he dare to make $70 billion in the process. 
But he leaves Microsoft and starts a charity. Oh, now he's a good guy. Not quite a saint. Now, I don't have any inroads with the Catholic Church. I'll have to, I'll have to ask the judge about this. But I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that to become a saint, Bill Gates will have to do what? Yeah, he'd have to give it all away, move in, live in a tent, and maybe show us a little bit of blood. Because that's what conventional morality suggests. It suggests that virtue equals suffering. Have you ever seen a painting in a museum of a saint with a smile on their face? No. Because that's not the point. The whole point is to suffer. It's not how much you benefit other people. If it was based on how much you benefit other people, Bill Gates would already be a saint. It's how much you suffer. And the question has to be asked, why? Why is other people's happiness more important than mine? Why should I live for some common good? I don't know any common. Why should I live for the public interest? I don't know the public. Why shouldn't I live? I've got one shot at this. This is the atheist in me coming out, right? I've got one shot of this. I've got one world in which to live. Why not make the most of my life in this world? Why not live the best, happiest, most flourishing, most successful, most engaging life that I can possibly live? And what does such a life require? Now, this, I think, is what morality should really be studying. Morality should be the science that studies what virtues and values people should pursue in order to achieve their maximum potential, in order to live the best life that they can live. Now, that would be a, an amazing project, a project started by Aristotle, continued by Ayn Rand. That is a project worth engaging in. What are those actions that we take that really lead, scientifically, to good life? Because we are a biological entity. We have a particular nature. Some things hurt us. Some things are good for us. Just like some food is poison, other food is good for us. So certain actions that we take in our lives, certain virtues that we engage in are good for us, and others are bad for us. We have a particular nature. So let's try to focus on what is good for us and do that. And it turns out, and again, you don't need to be a nuclear scientist to figure this out. It turns out that what's good for us is not exploiting other people. It's not lying, cheating, and stealing. It's using that one thing, that one resource that we have that makes us human. All our values come from one place. All our values come from one activity. All of our values, spiritual as well as material. And that is the human mind, a reasoning capability. To be selfish means to be rational. It means to use reason. It means to think about your own life and how you can maximize your own well-being, your own capacity to flourish over a lifetime, long-term, rationally. That's what virtue of selfishness really means. It means to think, to engage with the world, with your mind, to figure out the actions necessary and the values worth pursuing that will lead to a good flourishing, successful life. At the end of the day, your happiness is the purpose. What other reason are we here for, if not to live, to flourish, to be happy? And not, not, not the happiness that comes from a line of cocaine. The happiness that comes from living a good life, from producing, from creating, from building something, from making your life have meaning having a purpose, having self-esteem. So selfishness is the only virtue, in a sense. It's the purpose of life, is life, is your life. Make the most of it. Make the most of it by thinking, by reasoning, and by living. Thank you. Thank you, you're on. Gene Epstein will now make the negative case for 12 minutes. Well, my friend Yaron Brook is a force of nature in the cause of freedom and free markets. And I put Ayn Rand in the pantheon, and not just because of her, the enduring impact of her novels. In her objectivist writings, Rand reminds us that there is a real world out there and that the only way to understand it is through reason. But is selfishness a virtue? Uh, Yaren says yes, 
and so did Rand. Uh, she applied reason uh, to this question in her book of 1964, The Virtue of Selfishness. So let's go back to the seminal text. Uh, we'll find that on the rational terms Rand herself set, selfishness is clearly not a virtue. Uh, Rand begins by confronting the question of why she, she chose the word selfishness to, quote, denote virtuous qualities of character. In characteristic fashion, she answers, quote, for the reason that makes people afraid of it. She continues, the meaning ascribed in popular usage to the word selfishness is not merely wrong, it is responsible for the, moral, uh, for the arrested moral de uh, development of mankind. Yet, she continues, the exact meaning and dictionary definition of the word selfishness is concern with one's own interests. This concept does not include a moral evaluation. Now, uh, Yaron has at times referred to selfishness as Rand defined it, uh, but in her own statement, Rand made it, cl made it clear that it would be unreasonable for, for her to, def to, to define an English word according to her own preferences. That's why she cites the, quote, exact meaning and dictionary definition of the word, which does not include a moral evaluation. Now, Yaron just commendably did cite the exact meaning and, def and definition of the word because it always includes a moral evaluation. It always means, ever since Samuel Johnson's dictionary was written in 1773 and on through all of Webster's dictionaries, it always means moral disapproval. The dictionary writers were doing their job by reflecting the fact that all written records of the word have used it in this way. The only difference between what Yaron just said and what Ayn Rand wrote is that she was quoting what she called the exact dictionary def definition of the word, and she defined it as concern with one's own interest, full stop, not concern with one's own interest to the detriment of others, not to the expense of others, full stop, just concern with one's own interest. So Rand was being rational. She was pinning a definition on the dictionary, but she was misquoting the dictionary. Now, uh, why the sleight of hand? Why did Rand pretend she was citing the dictionary when she was clearly not doing so? Think of the heroic struggles she went through as an immigrant from the Soviet Union. Imagine that, like Rand, you and I grew up with the suffocating idea that anyone who refuses to serve the state is selfish. Also imagine that even in the U.S., we witness President John F. Kennedy in his 1961 inaugural address declare to much acclaim that we citizens must all ask what we can do for our country. If we had these experiences, we too might want to shout from the rooftops that selfishness is a virtue, just to jolt people out of their servility to the state. We too might want to rail against what Rand called the arrested moral development of mankind by calling selfishness a virtue, uh, given the popularity of Kennedy's statement. But since we don't bear Rand's scars, we don't have to go down that false and destructive root, and neither does Yaren. To echo the words Rand herself <laughs> used in her book, her use of the word selfishness is not merely wrong. It's done serious damage to public perception of the set of beliefs that Yaren and I both share. The use of the term needlessly antagonizes people by making it seem as though we who advocate freedom really do endorse a world in which people act in disregard of or at the expense of others. It does harm in another way. I've met followers of Rand who know what the word selfish really means and like to flaunt their indifference to others. These people do us no service. In a speech Rand delivered, she attacked Kennedy's statement, which read in full, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And in 1962, two years before The Virtue of Selfishness was published, a free market economist, Milton Friedman, uh, uh, took a principled stand against that statement in his book, Capitalism and Freedom, the same principled stand Rand had taken. But he declared that, 
The free man will ask neither what his country can do for him nor what he can do for his country. He will ask rather, how can we keep the government from destroying the very freedom we establish it to protect? Joining Friedman and picking up on a phrase she herself strongly endorsed, Rand might have declared that the individual's pursuit of happiness is a virtue. We're picking up on a popular word in the 1960s. She might have argued that, quote, self-actualization is a virtue, especially since self-actualization has been defined as the achievement of one's full potential through creativity, independence, spontaneity, and a grasp of the real world. There are, of course, greedy and selfish people, but we don't have to endorse Gordon Gekko's view that greed is good any more than we believe that selfishness is a virtue. Instead, instead, we cite Adam Smith's concept of the invisible hand. As Smith pointed out, in a market economy, greedy and selfish people can satisfy their aims only by selling us products we want to buy. The selfish are therefore led by a hand that is invisible them, to them to advance the interests of others. Yaron has written that business is a selfish activity. And it's a simple matter to correct Yaron's abuse of the English language through Smith's classic insight about the invisible hand. For Smith, who deplored selfishness, business can't be a selfish activity precisely because it advances the interests of others. And as he explains, the marvel of the market is that through the invisible hand, the efforts of the greedy and selfish are channeled to serve the interests of others. The distinction is simple. People may have selfish motives for offering others products may they, may, they may want to buy, but the activity is not selfish in itself. And plenty of people are in business for idealistic motives. Think of Steve Jobs, who, by the way, spoke about money only as a means of investment in the products he wanted to sell. Or of John Mackey, or of Howard Rourke of, of Rand's found, novel, The Fountainhead, who consciously devoted themselves to offering products that enhance the world. Now, oddly enough, uh, Yaron's tough-mindedness yields to naivete when he says, well, honesty the, is the best policy for all of us. Unfortunately, even in a market economy, the moral does not work that way. Yaron may decide that dishonest people and, and, and selfish people in this world are personally unhappy, but I wonder, economists Thomas Piketty and Paul Krugman have been made millionaires by the market for services that are without merit and have in fact done great harm. You can bet that if these two con men or countless others like them ever do pay the piper, it won't be until the afterlife. Uh, what do Harvey Fires Weinstein, Jack Warner, Harry Cohn, Alfred Hitchcock, and Louis B. Mayer have in common? Well, they're all Hollywood producers who were pr sexual predators against women. No, only, what they don't have in common is that only one of them, Harvey Weinstein, ever got caught. So we must tough-mindedly admit uh, that honesty is not always the best policy and that the market, that, that people are often naive and they buy snake oil from others. Uh, so uh, we cannot endorse the idea uh, that, uh, that selfishness leads uh, always to honesty. Selfishness can sometimes pay off. And to those who think government is the answer to regulating the potentially destructive effects of greed and selfishness, we cite the public choice theory of Nobel Prize winner James Buchanan, who called his theory politics without romance. Greedy and selfish opportunists will also be found in government, where the absence of market constraints permits them to act destructively and further their own selfishness, however unhappy Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton are, according to Yaron, who probably hasn't uh, had them confide in him uh, for quite a long time. Uh, as, Yaron, as Yaron and I both know, we advocates of laissez-faire capitalism are the only ones who can truly say that we care about the well-being of the broad masses of people, while the Bernie Sanders of this world are offering them snake oil that can only make matters 
matters worse. Yarno has also disavowed selfishness correctly defined. In a recent interview, Yarno was asked about whether he believed in a social safety net, and here's what he said, I believe in a safety net. I just don't believe the government should provide it. I don't believe I should be coerced to help them. You want to help them, I want to, want to help them. We can get together and help them voluntarily. Notice that Yaron said, I want to help them, and so would I. Adam Smith could have had us in mind when he wrote in 1759, how selfish soever man may be supposed there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others. Of this kind is pity or compassion, the emotion which we feel for the misery of others. Compassion is a virtue. Self-actualization is a virtue. But selfishness is not a virtue. You must vote no on the resolution. And in doing so, you'll be even truer to the rational ideals that Ayn Rand advocated. Thanks. Thank you, Gene. You're on. You now have five minutes of rebuttal, and we trust you will pull no punches. Only five minutes. This is going to take a while. Um, so Gene's view, as articulated, is the view the most free market supporters since Adam Smith has held. How's that worked out for you guys? Not very well. We are losing the battle for liberty. We're losing the battle for freedom exactly because of this view. Adam Smith laid the foundation for the defeat of the system he tried to defend. By positing that the activities of people in the marketplace were selfish, and therefore, eh, not so very positive morally. But if you aggregate them and you bring in something called the invisible hand, somehow they become virtuous. He laid the death knell for capitalism. Nobody believes that if you add up vices, you get a virtue. It doesn't make any sense. Indeed, morally, it is offensive. And that is why, even though almost all moralists agree with Adam Smith that the individual's behavior is selfish, therefore bad, they conclude that when you aggregate them all up, you must get a bad. One plus one equals two. By Inventing an invisible hand that is not explained morally. I'm not talking about economically. Economically, we understand how it works. Adam Smith laid the foundation for the defeat of capitalism. And unfortunately, one of the great tragedies of the 20th century is that free market economists continue with that deceit. No, the action of the baker in trying to take care of himself and his family is the essence of virtue. What is more important than living your life and making the best of your life and taking care of the people you love? That is the essential characteristic of what virtue is about. Now, Gene, of course, has to, as all opponents of um, selfishness have to, create straw men in order to attack Ayn Rand's view. Yeah, Steve Jobs didn't care about the money, but nobody said selfishness was about money. Selfishness is about human flourishing. It's, that's not money as a component, but money is not everything. So, of course, Steve Jobs didn't care about the additional dollar, although he cared in terms of measuring his success and, how, and the success of his products. But, yeah, Steve Jobs did what he did. Why? Because he loved it. He did it for himself. Hopefully, you all go to work and love what you do. For whom? For you. It's your self-esteem, it's your job, it's your life. And that is all selfish. And, and we can play dictionary games here. But the fact is that the people who wrote the dictionaries don't want us to believe in selfishness. The people who write the dictionaries want us to believe it's a vice because they want us to hold a self-sacrificial, altruistic morality because they want altruism is the great mechanism by which to control us all, by which to inflict guilt on us all. So think about why we regulate business. We regulate business because we have this confusion about selfishness. They're obviously selfish. Steve Jobs was obviously selfish. But selfish people are people who lie, steal, and cheat, and they're SOBs generally. So Steve Jobs must also be, 
in spite of his turtleneck shirts and being cool, also be a lying, stealing SOB. So we better get that government on his, on his, on his shoulder to watch and monitor. We, we redistribute wealth because you businessmen are too selfish to consider the fate of other people. I think selfish people have a huge interest in the fate of other people. It's not their top priority. Charity is not a top priority. But charity is part of life, particularly in a free market where there is no, where they're not taking 55% of our, of our money. There's no contradiction between some charity and selfishness. So you have to create a straw man in order to, to knock it down. Steve Jobs, businessmen generally, of course they're greedy. They're trying to make more money. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. But if we have a negative perception of greed and selfishness, we're obviously going to want to regulate and control. So the battle, in my view, for free markets, the battle, in my view, for liberty and freedom is not an economic battle. We won that 50, 60, 70 years ago. Maybe we even won it with Adam Smith. The battle is to eradicate the old Christian, or Judo-Christian, whatever you want to call it, morality of altruism, morality of living for the sake of others, and replace it with a morality of the virtue of selfishness. Thank you. Let him have it, Gene. <laughs> Gets the last word always. Well, uh, uh, Carl Popper. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Carl Popper, uh, the philosopher, once said, uh, "No rational argument will have a rational effect on a man who does not want to adopt a rational attitude." Uh, and uh, it, it's very clear that on the one hand, Ayn Rand did have a rational attitude. She did not permit herself to define a word like selfishness according to her own preferences. She cited the dictionary, albeit erroneously. Now, Yaren is unfortunately uh, enthralled to the cult of Ayn Rand's personality. If she lays down the law that selfishness is a virtue, we've got to stick to it no matter what doesn't matter if everybody else knows what the word really means. We've got to stick to it. Well, uh, uh, Yaron has talked about how we've been arguing for free markets for a long time, and where did that get us? Well, uh, he probably knows that uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, libertarians would have their meetings in phone booths, because there are usually only two or three of them in any city. Uh, now uh, we are countless. Uh, now uh, there are numerous libertarians. He probably knows that free markets since 1776 have played a huge role, despite what government has tried to do to lift the living standards of the broad masses of people. And I trust he recognizes that. Uh, it's really just a desire to be in people's faces, to try to use a word that offends most people, and uh, to use the kind of word that's meant as an insult and a put down with others. Because uh, Yaron doesn't think that, a that Adam Smith was truly retrograde in his views. I just quoted his book, <laughs> Theory of Moral Sentiments, in which Adam Smith said that, that, that most people do have, how selfish soever they are, there's compassion in all of us. So that's Adam Smith talking. His concept of the invisible hand is an extremely valuable one precisely because we must tough-mindedly recognize that there are selfish people in this world, totally self-interested, self-loving types, but if they want greedy people and if they want to survive, then they have to uh, provide us with products we want to buy. It's the selfish and the greedy prey on us precisely a via, by the way, the Bill Clintons and the Hillarys and the rest of them, via government. So all of that is straightforward. Ayn Rand could have echoed Milton Friedman. He was writing two years before and putting down uh, Kennedy's views. He was coming out for freedom. 
of self-actualization. Ayn Rand could have stood up for any number of things. I cut her a lot of slack. She was a refugee from the Soviet Union. She experienced the horrors of Bolshevism. She wanted to be in our face about these matters. I deeply respect her, but there's no reason for Yaren, who carries her torch, to continue uh, to alienate so many progressives, so many people who think that libertarians are uncaring uh, with this silly word selfishness. Why doesn't, look, what, I, I have a quote from, uh, from Mike, from that, that movie uh, with, uh, greed, uh, with uh, Michael Douglas playing Gordon Gecko. Greed is good. He writes, uh, greed is good, you know, greed, uh, greed for knowledge, uh, greed uh, for, uh, f for bettering yourselves, greed brings evolution. It's all very nice and persuasive, and I no doubt if, if, Aaron, if, if, if Ayn Rand had written Greed is a virtue, and then she said, all greed really means is wanting a little bit more. It doesn't mean, of course, wanting more to excess. It it's not an ugly passion. Yeah, and unfortunately, might, again, be enthralled to her cult and go around calling greed a virtue. It's... This silliness should stop. Yaren is indeed a force. Listen to some of his interviews when he talks about crony capitalism, when he talks about, uh, about, uh, about charity, about the safety net. All of those things are extremely valuable. He is an asset to our movement, and so are the vast majority of people uh, who subscribe to objectivism and to Ayn Rand's view. I'm, I'm only asking them to quit the madness, quit talking, about, talking in terms of these silly words that everybody knows are offensive, and quit trying to claim that they're good. You don't need that vocabulary to defend free markets and freedom. Thank you. All right, Gene, I'll let you catch your, catch your breath for just a minute because I want to put a question to you first while the other questions come in. And uh, Jim has begun to uh, text me the questions that are coming in from the folks that uh, are not with us. Aren't you and Yaron really on the same page? And isn't this just a semantic argument over the sounds of the word selfish? And doesn't it really have nothing to do with Ayn Rand? It's Nothing to do with Ayn Rand. Well, is greed... Uh, can I ask you a question, Judge? Is greed no, 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 no. Okay. This, is, this is my Nothing. courtroom, well, I, and, I, I've, okay. and I've put the question to you, Professor. Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. She put it out into the language. She defended the virtue of selfishness. She said, I want this word to be out there precisely because it gets people upset. This is the exact meaning of the word. Uh, ever since she wrote that book in 1964, a good many decades ago, we've been hearing this selfish mantra over and over again from Yaren. So it's not and others. So it's hardly, hardly something that has nothing to do with Ayn Rand. She put it out there, and she put it out there because she was a refugee from Bolshevism, and she hated, hated the state that would accuse her of being selfish because she didn't serve the state. We don't bear her scars. We don't have to continue this, uh, this foolish satire. Your Honor, respond, please. Well, I think it's ridiculous to attribute everything you don't like about Ayn Rand to experiences in the Soviet Union. But, uh, you know, the, 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 this, the, there's this tendency now to make everybody a product of their environment. Ayn Rand was a genius. She knew exactly what she was doing when she suggested the word selfish. She was trying to overturn a moral tradition. She was trying to question and challenge the long-standing, primarily Christian, but secular as well, tradition of self-sacrifice and altruism. And she was arguing that if you believe in man, not forget economics, forget freedom, forget politics, if you believe in you as a human being, then what we need is a different morality, a different moral code. She was challenging Adam Smith's moral code. She believed, and I believe, and I know he thinks I'm just a mouthpiece, for, an unthinking, I guess, mouthpiece fine man. That was the suggestion. Um, no one could suggest that you were unthinking. Well, I think Gene did. Um, but, I called you a force of nature <laughs> in the cause of freedom and free markets. But, no. And but, I believe that. But to me, to me, freedom and free markets are secondary. To me, much more important is what individuals pursue in their own life, the kind of life you 
as an individual take on yourself. And most important to me is the kind of life I take on for myself. And what Ayn Rand is trying to do is challenge us, is say this Christian morality of sacrifice and altruism is wrong. The morality that Adam Smith upheld in the um, uh, theory of moral sentiments is wrong. It's anti-life, it's anti-human, and ultimately it's anti-freedom and anti-capitalism. And she is presenting in that essay a new morality. And to the extent that we, as a free market movement, don't take that seriously, we will ultimately lose. This is a battle, the battle for liberty and freedom, that is won a loss in philosophy and morality, not in economics. And if we don't pick up the mantle, if you don't like the word selfish, use self-interest, use egoist. But the idea of placing one's own life, one's own well-being, one's own flourishing at the, at, the, at the center of one's life, as the goal of one's life, that is crucial to our victory, political and economic. But more importantly, again, it's crucial to you living a good life. And that's what you should care about. You should care about living a good life. All right. I know you want to catch your breath, but the questions have <laughs> no, started to come in. I never want to catch my breath. <laughs> so here's, here's a very interesting question for Iran. If a selfish person does a moral action, such as donating to a charity, because it makes him feel better, can we really call it selfishness? Look, Wouldn't it just be the empathy of the inherent human condition? But you see, the, the question has already bought into the anti-morality that I believe. Giving to charity is not necessarily moral. It might be, it might not be. What makes it moral is, is it rationally in your self-interest to give to charity? And I believe in some situations it is, and in some situations it isn't. If it comes out of the money that you would feed your kids, it is downright evil to give to charity. If, it, if your kids are more important than your neighbor's kids, you know, how many of you, if your kids are drowning and your neighbor's kids are drowning, go for the neighbor's kids first? <laughs> you selfish bastards, you love your children more than your neighbor's children. Okay. Right. No, so, so the framework has to be, the, the framework of this new moral code is not, is that what is your self-interest is moral. So charity is moral only if it's in your self-interest, if, you, if it's rationally supportive of your life in some way. And I believe charity can be, right. but isn't always. Bearing in mind that uh, Professor Epstein's offspring is seated in the front row, he wants to address the choice of who to rescue. I'm kidding, you want to respond to this. <laughs> <laughs> look, look. Again, I think Jean's again, again I, 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 we could throw out a lot of different words for Ayn Rand and for Yaron to defend. The word self-interest, by the way, is essentially in the dictionary. It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a milder version. He's a self-interested person, uh, slightly milder than selfish. Look, we have a lot of self-actualization, the pursuit of happiness. All of the, the individual's pursuit of happiness is a virtue. Isn't that good enough for all of us, for, the, for, for, for Yaron, uh, self-actualization is a virtue. Individuals do matter. Uh, and, and that's partly because, partly because I believe that Yaron and I both share Adam Smith's view that we are all compassionate, some of us very compassionate. Uh, Adam Smith even added that you find compassion even in the worst brigand. All that simple vocabulary that the English language offers uh, 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 covers all the bases that Yaron is so concerned about. Uh, so we don't need to misuse and abuse and do violence to the English language by establishing these principles. With respect to his comment about charity, of course, uh, there are a lot of charitable people in this audience. And your concern, it's a lot of hard work, because I've spoken to some of these people. I could mention Don Smith, who's in the front row, who's financed us. It's a lot of hard work to make sure that your money is going to a good cause. 
Hopefully, Don Smith still thinks that the soul form is a good cause. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and Yaron and I better mind our manners. Keep because, flattering him. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't yeah, exactly. We got, so we don't know. But of course, Yaron is right insofar as that's concerned. But why, do, why does he have to throw verbal wreckage uh, at, at statements that he's making right, so for no good reason? Let me, let me just quickly address this issue. Right. Look, selfish is opposed to what? It's opposed to selfless. We have lived, they're selfless and they're selfish. So, the, and that's the choice. Because again, for 2,000 years we've been told that goodness lies in being selfless. I'm not selfless. I think being selfless is bad, is wrong. And to counter that is the word selfish. And yeah, we can redefine, we can rewrite the dictionaries. That's, that's a good thing to do. That's a good thing to do in some cases. And let me just burst one other bubble that Gene has. I don't think compassion is that important. I don't think compassion changes the world. Compassion is nice. Most of us are compassionate sometimes. There's some people I'm not compassionate at all towards, at all. Uh, but compassionate is not a major virtue at all, in my view. All right, I have one I, more question. Hang on, Gene, sure. from, from the streamers, which is a good one because of the, your very eloquent reliance on words. Why do you rely so heavily on the dictionary definition which is tainted by 2,000 years of historical adoration of self-sacrifice? <laughs> Yaron, Yaron did not text me that question. As far as you know. As far as I know. It came from your son's we, filtering we, out we, here. <laughs> we, if, granting potentially granting that assumption about the dictionary, about the English language, uh, about how Adam Smith, Jane Austen, and others use words. Uh, we are unfortunately, Yaron and I, and everybody in the audience, we are stuck. We have to deal uh, with, the, with the cards that are played us. There are many, many words that, by the way, change their meaning over time, uh, that uh, have ambiguous definitions, but this word is not one of them. It's always meant uh, moral, uh, to, meant to convey moral disapproval. So we are stuck with the English language. Uh, why should the devil have the best tunes? We've got to use the devil's language. But also, addressing Yaron's concern, by the way, I agree with him. And, and, and by the way, in that answer he gave about helping uh, people in need, he made a very good point as well, which is uh, echoing, by the way, Adam Smith, who said, I have never known in the wealth of nations, when he's talking about the invisible hand, he says, I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. It's absolutely true that the market, via the invisible hand, where greedy and selfish people are involved and where the idealists are, are involved, the market takes care of human needs overwhelmingly. Uh, and indeed, I probably, Aaron and I, share the view that it seemed to have been antitrust who forced uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, out of his business. Bill Gates did far more for the world uh, with his operating system that pushed up the production possibility frontier of the world than he has done so far with his charity. Absolutely true. However, as Yaron himself said, there are people in need who through no fault of their own. There are people who slip, th slip through the net and he and I both believe in a social safety net done by compassionate people right. like Yaron and me. Now, now I'm going to address you as the founder of this feast. What is the procedure now for getting the audience to ask the oh, questions? Well, uh, yeah, line up. Uh, there's a microphone there that people see. Are they see? going to turn the lights up so I can see them? Um, maybe not. Is there, is, there, is there a questioner there? Please, please do your question. Go ahead, question. All right, so while they're, while they're lining up, do you find... Uh, problems dealing with uh, university students who are repelled, perhaps because of what their professors have told them, by the use of the word selfish and cannot sell that concept to their colleagues. I don't think, I don't think the word is ever the problem. Can you help young people sell the concept of selfishness without the sting often associated, perhaps by culture, with that word? Absolutely. Because if, if you translate it into Caring for self, if you translate it into flourishing as a human being, making your flourishing your primary uh, moral goal in life, 
that the goal in life is the pursuit of happiness. What's more selfish than the pursuit of happiness? That is the essence of selfishness. Is the pursuit of happiness the essence of selfishness? No, the, the essence of selfishness, as the word means, uh, as, uh, and, and as the word definitely denotes, is that it means somebody who pursues his own goals to the detriment of others, who rolls over the interests of others. But you who see, Gene is not interested in this pursuit of happiness. This is the issue, right? Because Gene, every time, returns to this moral obligation that he feels towards charity and towards helping the poor. Yes, they're poor people, but they're a minor issue in a free market. I just said the that. Issue, the issue of, of, of poor people is a minor, trivial issue. And yet, every conversation, we keep coming back to, but we need a safety net. Who, you know, a safety net, yes, yeah, safety net. There'll be a safety net. Who cares? Safety it's, net, like less than, it's less than 1% of the people. It's, it's, that is not the barrier to explaining capitalism. Can it's a, people taking seriously their own lives. Can a selfish person contribute voluntarily to a safety net and still remain selfish? Well, I think Harvey Weinstein probably contributed to a safety net, and, and he's a real selfish pick. But, but so look what kind so of a life he's But by the way, I completely agree with what so Yaron said. He doesn't seem to be listening to me. Uh, he's behind the... He, I, I said, indeed, I agree with him, that a flourishing capitalism where everybody participates will take care of most people, the vast majority of us. Well, it will lift the standard of living of the broad, broad mass of people. That has to be taught to people, absolutely. And Yaron is an important voice for that. Of course, indeed, compassion is a relatively a minor affair in that. On, on the other hand, we do want idealists like, like Steve Jobs, people, and Howard Rourke, by the way, who want to change the world through their, through their products, real visionaries who care about changing the world. That's what most of the great entrepreneurs were all about. They cared less about money than about changing and helping the world in a compassionate way. Right, be, before I go to the podium to take questions from the audience, I can't see you. Are, are there questions? All right, good. Good, good. First one, I reserve the right to, to edit them, to rephrase them, or redirect them. So no speeches, just a question. Sir. Right. You're on. Uh, Gene started off twice by referencing Ayn Rand's statement that selfish is a neutral term. So I guess you lose. But the whole book is entitled The Virtue of Selfishness. So isn't there a equivocation between the word selfish and selfishness, the action? You're on. Are we hair splitting over the meaning of words, or is there an inherent conflict between the concept of selfishness and the concept of virtuousness? No, there's no. There's obviously no conflict. I think the two are the same. I think we're not splitting words because at the end of the day, Gene and I disagree about the content of morality, in spite of here trying to deny that fact. So put aside the word. Let's forget selfishness. The actual content of morality we disagree on, and he's trying to paint. My view is, again, he returned to this idea of money. Nobody mentioned money. Ayn Rand doesn't mention money in that essay. Money is not what she's talking about when she talks about the virtue of selfishness. The virtue of selfishness is about living. It's about making the most of your life. That's what selfishness is. That's what selfishness means. And while in the... Her, I don't know what dictionary she pulled that definition of. I will, I will research that for Gene's sake. I will send him... The reference in the dictionary which she took that from. Okay. I bet you there is such a dictionary she didn't make it up. Gene, would you have this conflict with Yaron if the word selfishness did not have the odious sting that it does? Suppose it was well, the word flowers. Well, if the word, I guess, I, I guess if the word greed uh, it didn't have the odious sting, he's a greedy, ba greedy, usually it's greedy bastard. The opposite of the word greed, I guess, is give, everybody gives. The word greed, the word hateful, uh, the word Jew hater, the word, all of those things, if those words didn't have a sting, I guess I'd be all for Yaron. Uh, they would be fine. However, there are words that we use uh, for people uh, who are morally odious. Uh, and that's part of our language. They're important parts of the language. Now, I don't know if Harvey Weinstein was in it for the money. It seemed like he basically wanted the sex. Of course that's true. Uh, so I didn't say that selfish predators like Weinstein are only after money. Of course, they may be after other odious things, of course. But, uh, but uh, these hypothetical questions uh, obviously have no point. See, but uh, when these but words but are Gene, unambiguously you, for ahead. bad people. Go when ahead, you call right. Weinstein selfish, you then are confusing people by putting him in the same bucket as Steve Jobs. Because everybody knows Steve Jobs was selfish. 
because he was out there to pursue his vision for the world, not your vision for the world, his vision for the world. So, so what I'm asking for is to separate Weinstein out and keep the purity of Steve Jobs. And you do that by not calling Weinstein selfish, but by calling him what he truly is, which is a predator, a self-destructive human being. His behavior, see, selfish means promoting self. Weinstein did not promote himself. Weinstein destroyed himself. And just look at him. He's a destroyed human being. And he is a self, just like Bernie Madoff, these people are self-destructive. And to call them selfish confuses people about the nature of capitalism. And this is why, one of the reasons why we cannot convince people because they think, we know that businessmen are selfish. <laughs> You're not going to convince us otherwise, right? And selfishness is bad. Okay. Next question from the audience. Steve, our job had a vision to change the world and offer us change products. Change the world and change our vision. lives. Hang selfish. on, hang on, time out. Who's, who's next from the audience? Yes, Jen. Yes. Hi. Uh, this question is for Euron. So I'd like to probe a little bit um, how you feel about a situation where your self-flourishing and your self-actualization has to pit against um, some kind of social duty or um, responsibility towards, say, your family members. So, you know, a classic example is a person who is called to be so passionately involved in some kind of calling that they may um, abandon their parental responsibilities or other kinds of social responsibilities. Um, and, you know, is that selfish? And how do you feel about that? Okay, so can selfishness justify the impairment of other voluntarily accepted duties and responsibilities, like being a good parent? So I don't consider being a good parent a social responsibility. I don't know what social responsibility means. I don't know what that concept is. Uh, when you have a baby, you are taking on a responsibility. You're taking on a implicit contract to take care of this child until they're an adult. And that is a primary responsibility. It's not the only responsibility you have, but a primary responsibility that you have to, for your own well-being, for your selfish own life. But not No, I know. But you look, sometimes I sign a contract, right? And halfway through the implementation of that contract, I change my mind. Okay. Tough, right? I still have to fulfill the contract, okay. right? And the same thing with having kids. You can change your mind. Suddenly, many of us, somewhere around between nine months and three years, <laughs> had a change of heart over and over and over again. But you made that commitment when you have that baby, and it's in your selfish interest to fulfill that commitment because you couldn't live with yourself, I think, as a, as a complete human being otherwise. Many people abandon that commitment. And I personally think, I mean, Gene might not agree with me, I think Weinstein and all those scumbags in Hollywood suffer the consequences of their na evil behavior. I think people who abandon their children suffer the consequences, not in an afterlife, right here and now, this life. Uh, you know, they are dealt with psychologically, they are dealt with into Let's, let, thank, oh, well, you, thank you, thank you. Hold on, hold on. Let's have another a question, and this one for Gene Epstein, please. So who's up next with a question for Gene Epstein? Sir. Do you think there's a difference between sacrifice and investment? Like a baseball player does a sacrifice pop fly for his team. I sacrificed, so Mike, but it was my kids that went to college. Does anybody really do something for something less? Or as you said, is it just, is it a bad investment? Or I think you used the word unreasonable. But I, yeah. So well, I, again, I, I, I do think that uh, there is a word called compassion, which Adam Smith used, uh, and uh, that we all feel it. And uh, so uh, people who make sacrifices are, to some degree, sacrifice of money, sacrifice of time. Uh, they, uh, they feel compassion. Uh, and they feel good about it. They are not selfish. And just a comment, it's, it, 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 the, the oddity in, in Yaron's view is indeed that all selfish and hateful and predatory people eventually have to pay the piper or that they're deeply unhappy. Uh, this is, uh, that honesty is always the best policy. This is unfortunately a terribly naive view. Uh, and uh, so again, I add that 
Other Hollywood producers, Jack Warner, Harry Cohn, Alfred Hitchcock, Louis B. Mayer, uh, they all got away with it. Uh, and it's only lately that people are not getting away with it. And it's a little silly, it's a little childish for us to say, oh, well, they were deeply unhappy in their heart. Or that Paul Krugman or Thomas Piketty actually will eventually look at themselves in the mirror and realize <coughs> what professional liars they are, and, and even though they've been enriched by the market. Again, unfortunately, rather naive. Uh, in that case, as I say, the crucial point to bear in mind is that at least these people are functioning in the market. They are selling snake oil, and the market is buying it. Yuron, but how much more dangerous would they be if they were in government? Yaron, do you want to reply? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, yeah, I, I, I am com completely convinced that Paul Krugman is suffering from the fact that he is a real scumbag. Uh, there's no question about that. But, uh, but uh, again, I don't equate money with happiness. Yes, he's making a lot of money. That doesn't mean much to me. The fact that he is cheating on reality, the fact that he is lying to himself and to the world has, has, because I understand human nature, has consequences to his consciousness. He is not a flourishing, successful human being. But let me answer the question about sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice is another one of these terms that is muddled, that is confused. And many people use sacrifice instead of investment. Uh, I, I think that is, a, is bad English and bad linguistics. Sacrifice is what Jesus did. He got crucified for sins he did not commit. He got crucified for your sins. Sacrifice is giving up something more important, your life for the sake of something less important, your sins, other people's sins. Um, so sacrifice is a negative. It is a bad thing. It's self-sacrifice. But again, a lot of people use it, like in basketball, he sacrificed for the team. No, he wants to win. He's selfish. He wants his team to win. And he's willing to score a few less points or take a few less shots in order to achieve victory. That's what selfishness means. So there are a lot of terms, unfortunately. The bad guys have made this very clear. You see it in economics as well. There are a lot of terms that are being muddled by the people who do not want us to realize our own potential as human beings and there's a lot of uh, cleaning up the dictionary, if you will, and, and sacrifice and selfishness are two words that need to be cleaned up. Yaron and I are both Jews who chose not to follow Jesus, so I agree with him about that part of it, by the way. Did you have to bring Jesus into this? We did. And, and what's this Jewish stuff? What are you talking about? <laughs> you, told me, you told me your parents kept kosher. You told me that. Your parents kept kosher. They're Jews. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm All a right, good go atheist. Ahead. Okay. Uh, Gene, do you want to reply to this, and then we're going to go to the uh, summations? No, it's okay. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Next question for uh, Gene, please. Uh, actually, my question is to you both. Uh, I want to bring up an unlikely thinker, I think, a lefty who by accident made a good point about this topic, <laughs> uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, to be more precise. Uh, in his book, The Selfish Gene, he explains that um, selfishness is about maximizing the probability, um, survival probability of your genes and also your memes. So that means, of course, your thoughts, whether it is uh, liberty or equality, whatever. So um, I think he explains well in that regard because that explains why I would care most about my okay, children. Can you put this in the form of a question, please? Sure. Could you please comment? <laughs> <laughs> You want to take I mean, that one first, Mr. Energy? I mean, there's a lot to say about, about the, the book, The Selfish Gene. And uh, I think a lot of issues there, a lot of, a lot of challenges. And primarily, um, human beings are different. Uh, evolution has done something to human beings that is amazing and great. And we have free will. And we get to, we get to recode. We're not just, in spite of the evolutionary psychologist, we don't just do what our genes tell us to do. We actually have reason and we have the capacity to dictate what our life will be. So while Richard Dawkins' perspective on the selfish genes is all you want to do is multiply. And if that were the case, all we'd want to do is, you know what, uh, is, 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 is everything, uh, everything we would do would be focused on sex and, 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 uh, and, and you know, uh, procreation. I, I, I think we're more than that because of the capacity to reason, because of the capacity to rewrite the software, if you will, because we have free will. 
Gene. All, all rather interesting. Uh, uh, I can only comment on it that you know you, you could you know there's a movie I love called The Hateful Eight. Uh, now uh, there's uh, maybe you could have called the book The Greedy Gene. Uh, now obviously when people uh, uh, write books they use titles. They might use uh, words in slightly odd contexts. Uh, but uh, obviously when we are talking in objective terms, uh, in rational terms about the world. Uh, then, and about human behavior, uh, then, uh, then, then we have to use words according to definitions that in the case of selfish has never, ever changed. There are words that do change their meaning. There are words that have ambiguous meanings, not words like greedy, hateful, selfish. Uh, All right, in order to keep to our uh, prearranged time schedule, we're, we're going to have the closing arguments now. Yaron will go first for five minutes. And Gene will follow for five minutes, and then we'll have the voting. So as Gene admitted, words change over time. For 2,000 years, those who advocated for self-sacrifice, for, uh, for enslaving the individual to the group, enslaving the individual to the collective, have wanted us to believe that there are two alternatives in morality. Two alternatives in living. One is to live for the sake of others, to be altruistic, to place the well-being, happiness, and good of other people above self. The alternative to that has been presented as being a lying, stealing, cheating SOB. Selfish, in other words. Those are the two alternatives presented. What Ayn Rand is offering is a third alternative. An alternative that says that you can live for yourself, rationally, honestly, with integrity, pursuing justice, pride, be, being proud, committed to your own morality and your own moral perfection, living the best life that you can live for yourself in pursuit of your own happiness. That new moral code, and it's a new moral code, at least since the advert, the advent of Christianity, it's, it's, it, it, it's somewhat reminiscent of Aristotle's of Aristotle's moral code, again, his focus on self, on self, on egoism, right? Guys. <laughs> so what Ayn Rand is asking is to, is to eliminate this dichotomy that is being set up by the enemies of the individual, by the enemies of human life, by the enemies of freedom and liberty. It's not sacrifice for others or be an SOB. No, there is the third alternative, which is to be long-term, rationally self-interested, long-term, rationally selfish, long-term, rationally an egoist. And if you understand what egoism means, what it means to live a life, what it means to flourish, what it means to attain human happiness, then you don't need the long-term rational anymore. It's just to be an egoist, to be self-interested, to be selfish. It's time to change the definition of the word. It's time to reject the 2,000 years definition of what morality was. It's time for a new moral code. A moral code based on what leads to individual success, what leads to individual happiness. Not, it's not about money, although money is a, is a component of happiness and success and flourishing. But it's not just about money. It's about living the best life that you can live and making that your moral mission. Now, what is morality? morality? Morality is about the values, the virtues and values that you choose in pursuit of your life, the important values. And the question is, who should be the beneficiary of those values? Selfishness says you should be that beneficiary. You should benefit from the stuff you produce, in it, that nobody has a right to guilt you into taking the things that you produce. That you shouldn't feel guilty about your success. So many businessmen I meet feel guilty. Why? Because they've been taught that their self-interest is somehow tainted. That their willingness, their interest in pursuing success in life, put aside the money, success in producing great products, in changing the world based on their vision. They are taught that that is immoral somehow. That they should feel bad about it. And they're inflicted with guilt. Here are incredibly successful people who've done wonderful things in the world. And they feel guilty. That's tragic. And what, why do they feel guilty? 
because they're told that their motivation, their motivation to make the most of their life, their selfish motivation, is somehow tainted and somehow evil, and that the ideal is some Mother Teresa somewhere. No, Mother Teresa is not the moral ideal. The moral ideal is a productive individual pursuing his values without sacrificing to anybody and without asking anybody to sacrifice for him, living an independent, rational, successful, happy life. It's about each individual. That's what morality should be about, and that's what Ayn Rand offers us in her book, The Virtue of Selfishness. Thank you. Jane Epstein for five minutes. Well, it's time to change the dictionary definition of the word. I guess that's what Yaron said. Also, I guess part of the joke is that I bet, he said, I bet that Ayn Rand did find that definition in the dictionary that did not include a moral evaluation, and I'll find it by God. Well, you know, I actually uh, went to the trouble of looking up dictionaries published at the time, uh, and uh, th they all obviously said that, uh, that the word is indeed... Uh, uh, defined as something that does include a moral evaluation. Ayn Rand just didn't bother to do her homework. Do you know, do you know uh, if I were to talk about Adam Smith, I could, I could criticize him for so many other things. Is Ayn Rand perfect? Every time I hear Yaren say Ayn Rand was a genius, I know what really is implicit in that, that she was uh, some goddess, some walk-on-water person who could not make any kind of uh, mistake. That, well, there's not a thinker that I personally admire and have learned from, from Adam Smith to Murray Rothbard to others who have not not to Ludwig von Mises, uh, who have not made mistakes at times. There's no reason uh, to live uh, with those mistakes. Now, uh, Yaren seems to think that by pushing the word selfishness, by misusing the English language, even though there are so many other words in the English language that we could use uh, to promote uh, the uh, individual freedom, that he has to keep using the word selfishness. And he seems to think uh, that he needs to say, oh, it's good to be selfish, that he can't tell businessman. He can't quote Adam Smith, who wrote in the, in the Wealth of Nations, I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. Adam Smith, who said so eloquently that, that, that all you have to do is make a living, provide a product that people want to buy, and you'll be doing good in the world. Because obviously, people are taking the affirmative step and wanting to buy it. That's all we need to be able to tell the world. We don't have to confuse uh, people with foolish language. Uh, we don't have to go around saying uh, greed is good. Uh, we have to recognize again that greed is channeled, as Adam Smith said. Uh, we don't have to go around, by the way, where I agree with Yaren, is we don't have to go around saying that the world needs far more benevolence than, than, uh, than, than it ever has gotten. Because, look, two, do you, did you know that 2% that of nominal GDP goes to charity in this country? Did you know that as nominal GDP grows, that 2% continues and continues to grow? That's $400 billion a year? We, and that's in a situation in which government does so much crowding out of charity. So we only have to point out that to this small extent to which people in need uh, will need help, that money is there. The compassion is there. We only need to point out that the pursuit of happiness, uh, that, that, uh, th that self-actualization, that the realization of self is very important because we believe uh, that people people are compassionate. Uh, we believe uh, that, uh, that people are energetic and they had visions. We don't have to call Steve Jobs selfish because he had a vision. What vision did he have? He had a vision that the world could be liberated by the products that he wanted us to buy. He had a vision for us all. That's the vision he had. That's an idealistic vision. That's not a selfish 
vision. Uh, and there are other vision, minor visionaries. We, we, were, we, we had back-to-back -back obituaries about Sam Bass of the Strand Bookstore, who died recently, uh, uh, and who, whose vision, whose sole goal was to, was to, mark, was to sell us second-hand books at a discount because he loved books. Uh, we, 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 had a, we had a vision of the guy who ran Lincoln Plaza Cinemas uh, who wanted to sell us art films. The world is filled with, with idealists who really want to sell us visions. So we have a more than adequate vocabulary that, by the way, that Yaren has contributed to in order to deal uh, with our vision for freedom and free markets. And we, we can call a halt. We can end the craziness. We can end a situation in which Ayn Rand actually tells us that, uh, that, that the word selfishness has no moral, uh, mor moral implication. I finally want to end on a bet. Yaren, you want to find a dictionary in which Ayn Rand found this? My hundred to your ten. I pay you a hundred. You send it out. You send out that dictionary and you cite it. I looked up all the dictionaries. That is got him crazy because he is so desperate, desperate to defend this goddess. Uh, my hundred to your ten, Yaren. Thank you very much. So now we'll uh, proceed to vote. Those of you who are uh, remote and those of you who are here, I'm going to talk for a few minutes while everybody votes until the tabulator of the votes, who's also seated in the front row, tells me that she has them uh, tabulated. This is the first time I have been to the Soho Forum, even though my day job keeps me in debates like this, not usually as high brow or as meaningful as this. I have done my best to be neutral between two dear and longtime friends, even though I am sometimes referred to, notwithstanding my pre-Vatican II Roman Catholicism, <laughs> as the Ayn Rand of Fox News. So Stossel used to call me up and say, Judge, every time you say taxation is theft, my people are killing me. I said, why are your people killing you? Because you don't want to say that taxation is theft. The first time I tried a case, I walked out into a courtroom. There were about this many people in the courtroom. When you start out as a judge, you start out with small claims cases. So the typical case is the dry cleaner ruined my dress, but he also tried to pick up my sister. Lawyer said to me, Judge, we need a translator for this case because my client doesn't speak English. I said, what language does your client speak? He said, Italian. I called the courthouse administrator to see if the Italian translator was available, and she was not. So I said to the throngs, is there anybody here that speaks Italian? Little guy in the back raised his hand. He comes up. We swear him in to translate literally. Here's exactly literally what happened. Lawyer to translator, give the court your name translator to witness, what is it, your name? <laughs> All right, let me see where this is going to go. All right, counsel, ask your next question. Lawyer to translator, give the court your address. Translator to witness, where is it, your house? <laughs> I looked at this character. I said, I thought you told me that you could speak Italian. He said, I can't hear, Anna, but my English, she's not a too good. One time I was trying a case involving uh, drug distribution. Even though I'm of the view that you can put into your body whatever you want, I did take an oath to uphold the laws of the state of New Jersey, which employed me as a judge. Actually, it wasn't the state that employed me. It was the Constitution. The state paid the uh, salary. And the state police had stopped a, oh, a truckload of cocaine coming off the George Washington Bridge into Fort Lee. 1,500 pounds of cocaine. I knew nobody was going to want to be a, a, a juror in this case. But I had this many jurors, potential jurors, from whom I had to choose 12 who had no bias, no interest, no prejudice, no interest in the outcome, no knowledge of the facts. Like a brand new, naive judge, I said, is there anybody here that doesn't want to be on this jury? Lady in the back raises her hand. Yes, madam, what is it? I can't be on the jury because of my occupation. I'm thinking, what the hell does she do for a living? <laughs> All right, madam, uh, what do you do? She said, Your Honor, I'm a soothsayer. A soothsayer? <laughs> this is 1992, and you're calling yourself a soothsayer. I foolishly said, how does that keep you from being on the jury? She said, Judge, I already know how the trial ends up. <laughs> I should have said, tell us now, lady, and save us the next three weeks in the courtroom. 
So when I was a uh, freshman at uh, Princeton taking Economics 101 and I was home for Thanksgiving, you're on and uh, Gene have both heard this. The first time I was in my childhood bedroom, having been away at college since August. And the first night I fell asleep in my childhood bedroom, in my childhood bed, in my parents' home as a freshman at Princeton, I fell asleep reading a book for Economics 101. And the next morning when my mother woke me up, she had the wooden spoon in her hands. What's this all about? The book that was on my chest was called the virtue of selfishness. She goes, Princeton ruined you. How can you read a book like this? <laughs> Judge, that's going to affect the voting. I think we have the results. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Mother, it's about economics. So results? she was she okay. was 42 then. She's 92 today. So Wait. whenever she wants to needle me and remind me of this event, she goes, Princeton ruined you. The judge, the judge should have been a warm up act. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have the voting. Why don't you come up? Are we ready with the results? Note that I had nothing to do with the tabulation. <laughs> okay. To start the um, at the start of the debate, the um, affirmative had. 47% of the vote, and at the end of the debate, 57% of the vote for a 10% percentage point change. And the, the negative had 20% uh, of the vote to start, 35% um, of the vote to end for a 15 percentage point change. So Gene takes the day. Um, and the bar is open.